Before we head the best part of 2,000 years back to Corinth and to our passage from the first half of chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, I'm going to ask you to reflect upon the following questions as we consider what's before us today. Questions that I've had to mull over for myself whilst preparing for this service. How does your faith in Jesus affect the relationships you have with other people in this church? Or to put that question another way, how does your faith in Jesus influence the way that you think of, you treat, you care for, you speak to your brothers and sisters in Christ? Does it actually make any difference at all? I want you to ponder those questions this morning. And if you're not a Christian, I just want to encourage you to consider how you conduct your relationships with family, with friends, with work colleagues, with those around you. And think about what that might tell you about the priorities of your heart, what's important to you. Keeping these questions in mind then, let's go to Corinth and specifically to the first 11 verses of chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, read for us earlier by Joy. This is Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. And from our prior studies in this letter, we've already got a sense of some fairly significant issues within the Corinthian church, which Paul is determined to address through what is actually his second letter to the Corinthians, albeit the first that we have recorded in the Bible. You'll remember those of you that attended last week that Jim Crooks explored chapter five with us where we found Paul addressing a case of sexual immorality within the church centered upon a man who was sleeping with his father's wife, his stepmother. And at the close of this part of the letter, Paul calls on the church to discipline the man in question. And he writes these words, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? Paul points out that the responsibility of the church is to address wrongdoing within the church, not outside of it. In the first half of chapter 6, our passage for today, Paul deals with a related but contrasting issue, what we might call the other side of the coin. And this is where wrongdoing within the church has been taken outside of the church for judgment rather than being dealt with in-house. So in essence, the crux of the problem seems to be this, that one church member has defrauded another in some way, perhaps in respect of a business transaction or a property matter. So if you look at verse 8, of chapter 6. Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. We're not given the specific details of what's taken place, but the aggrieved party has clearly felt strongly enough about it um, that he has decided to take a lawsuit out against the perpetrator. This with a view to settling the matter in court rather than in the church. So if you look at verse 1, if any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? In the Greek city of Corinth, that would have involved a visit to the civil magistrates at the Bima, which was simply the judgment seat where the local magistrate would sit, publicly located in the heart of the marketplace. If we were to consider a Dundonian equivalent, it would be like having an open-air court session um, between the waterfalls at the city square in full view of everyone passing. But in truth, it would be much more than that because people wouldn't simply be passing. No, they'd actually be gathering to watch. To understand this, we need to remember one of the potential pitfalls that Matty spoke about when introducing this series on 1 Corinthians. And that is that we treat the Corinthian church almost as if it's just like Hillbank, set in a very similar set of circumstances um, and culture to our own. But the reality is that Corinth was a very different place to Dundee and the specifically Greco-Roman culture 
in which the church was located was very different to the one in which we live. This is a world in which honour, reputation, having a good standing mattered. These were things to chase, to hold on to. Especially as a man, as this was still very much a man's world, one in which women and children were considered much less important. And if that quest for honour and good standing required a trip to the court, then so be it. Corinth was a city in which every man was to some degree a lawyer and would typically spend a great part of his time either deciding or listening to law courts. The Greeks were famous, even notorious, for their love of going to court because Greek culture found a good legal battle entertaining. Anyone's lawsuit soon became public knowledge. People would watch these court battles in the heart of the marketplace with interest in the way that we might watch a good film or a good series on Netflix. And, and indeed, this is a culture that was very different even to the one in which Paul would have been raised as a Jew. Because Jews didn't normally go to the law courts at all. They would settle their matters before the elders of the village or at their local synagogue. Indeed, Jewish law forbade a Jew to go to law at all in a non-Jewish court. To do that was considered blasphemy against the divine law of God. And what becomes very clear on reading our passage is that Paul is absolutely horrified at the behavior of these Corinthian Christians in pursuing lawsuits against each other. His horror goes far beyond any kind of cultural sensitivities as a Jewish man. He doesn't hold back in identifying the issue. He makes clear both the problem and his disapproval of it through a series of rhetorical questions. And by that, we just mean questions designed to make his point rather than seek out an answer. We find an example of that if you look in verse 4 in respect of the things of this life. Paul asks, therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? Paul is not looking down on those outside of the church here. He's simply pointing out that there's something ludicrous about Christians taking their disputes to those whose values and lifestyles were or should be completely different to their own as followers of Christ. But the Corinthian Christians caught up in their little lawsuits were still very much focused on the here and now like everyone else outside of the church. To return to the series of questions I posed at the start of our time together about how faith in Jesus might impact upon a Christian's relationship with those within the church, the Corinthians were suggesting by these behaviours that their faith in Jesus had very little influence in this area. What appeared to matter most to them was the same things that mattered to those outside of the church. Things like reputation, money, property, settling scores, getting revenge. Their grip was still firmly upon the things of this world rather than upon the things of God. And in being this way, they weren't only letting in the influence of the world around them, they were also giving expression to what was still inside of them. Because if you're a believer, you'll know that being a Christian isn't about experiencing moral perfection. Better experience will show you that moral perfection is not where we're at as Christians. We still struggle with old habits, don't we? We struggle with selfish natures, with pride, with greed, with lust, a whole range of sins. As the Apostle Paul writes in his first epistle to fellow Christians, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we can already start to see a relevance here for us as Christians in Hillbank in 2023. Because just like the Corinthian believers, we've got to deal with what's inside of us, but we also have to deal what's outside of us. We live in a very different culture from the one in which the Corinthian church resided. But as it was for them, it's very easy for us to get caught up with the same values that our society prizes that matters most to people out there. 
to hold fast to perhaps what our families or our friends or work colleagues care most about. And we live in a world which tells us that what's most important is to be true to yourself. It's to be what you want to be, to pursue your dreams, to do your own thing. And it's hard not to be affected by that. It's hard not to be influenced by that kind of thinking. And if you put that together with our own internal struggles with sin as Christians, then you'll have a powerful and dangerous mix. How might that combination affect the way that we interact with each other here at Hillbank? At least we're not taking lawsuits out against each other, are we? No, we're not, thankfully, we're not. But I've spoken to Christians even here who've had experiences not far removed from that in other churches where Christians have been battling Christians in ways that have divided and destroyed churches and provided a very poor witness to those looking in. So we need to take this subject seriously. How might we get caught up in conflict with our fellow believers? Well, quite easily, actually, and it'll probably start on an individual basis. Here's some potential scenarios that might not be beyond the realm of possibility. Perhaps we could find ourselves ignoring or avoiding a fellow Christian in the church because we imagine ourselves to be better than them or because they seem too different to us or because they've annoyed us in some way. Or we find ourselves only drawing near to those that we're attracted to, whether because of their intelligence, their looks, their personality, whatever it might be. We gossip about someone in the church to draw close to one person at the expense of another. Or we find ourselves being short with people because they aren't doing things the way that we do them. And the way that we do them is always best. And that might even include our own elders and deacons because who are they to tell us what to do? We could do it better. And if we do something well, we expect to be commended and we become irritated and frustrated when we're not. And if someone was to dare to offer us constructive feedback, to dare suggest that it was something that we needed to look at, even to change, well, they might get both barrels of the resentment gun. The truth is that there's a million ways in which we might behave towards our fellow believers that evidence is a sin within, within us and the influence of the world out with, and which could lead to significant conflict. And of course, these types of interactions are witnessed at times by those that are not Christians, those that observe us and draw their own conclusions. These guys aren't different from anyone else. They talk a good game, but they don't walk it. I've heard them say that Jesus changes lives, but they don't seem any different to me. So the question comes back to us. How does our faith in Jesus, how does our faith in Jesus affect the way that we conduct our relationships with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Is it simply a case of trying harder, of walking around in a state of constant fear, worried about what we say and do to each other? Is that the answer for us today? Certainly Paul takes the behaviour of the Corinthian Christians towards one another very seriously indeed. You look at verse 7 here. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you've been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? How can Paul say this? Well, before we consider Paul's thinking on this subject, we need to be very clear that Paul is not addressing every kind of wrongdoing that takes place within church walls. Please note, please note that this dispute between Corinthian Christians does not involve significant criminal matters such as physical abuse, sexual abuse or embezzlement. So at no point during our time together today will you hear any suggestion that Christians should handle matters of that nature, serious matters, in-house. In his letter to the Romans, Paul makes clear the need for Christians to be, do that again, I'll be lost out here. 
That's me now. Sorry about that. But Paul makes clear the need for Christians to live subject to the governing authorities. And he notes that rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. There's no teaching in the Bible, none whatsoever, that supports the idea that the church should hide the crimes of those in their midst. Now, in the passage before us, Paul is addressing what is essentially a civil matter rather than a criminal one involving significant harm. But why then does Paul suggest that the Corinthian Christians have been completely defeated already? Why would he suggest that he should accept being cheated, accept being wronged rather than take lawsuits out against each other? Wouldn't that just make the Christians weak, easy to push around? easy to take the mickey out of? What about their reputation, their honour? Why should someone walk all over them in this way, do wrong against them and get away with it? Even if that person happened to be a Christian, what kind of mindset would allow someone to think in this way? A way that was totally out of tune with the values of this society, which encouraged men particularly to seek a good reputation an honourable standing, the respect of people around them. Well, to understand Paul's radically different thinking in this conflict and to start to get a sense of how we can approach this challenging subject, we need to go to back, back to verse 2 of our passage and the curious reference that we see there about judging the world, even angels. Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world... Are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? I don't propose to try and unpick how and what judging angels will involve for Christians come judgment day. But to spend our time thinking about that would be to miss the central thrust of Paul's argument here. What Paul is doing is reminding the Corinthian church of their identity what it is to be God's people, to be those whose future will involve being with the creator of the universe at the end of time, where these Corinthian Christians will even be involved in judging angels and judging the very people that in the present they're bringing their trivial little lawsuits to. Paul is asking the Corinthian Christians to step back from their petty squabbles and to see the bigger picture who they are as Christians, what they're called to be as God's holy people set apart for him. For Paul, this mind-blowing, incredible future for God's people to be at his side, judging the world, even angels, is not some pipe dream. It's not some fantasy dreamland. No, for Paul, it's a fixed and certain destination. And it needs to bear upon everything that these Christians are and everything that they do in the present. I can barely say this, but this is what theologians sometimes refer to as Paul's eschatological perspective, which is simply a fancy way of describing a focus upon end times, upon death, upon judgment day, upon the eventual destination of the human soul. And that destination for the Corinthian Christians then, and for us now, is a breathtaking prospect. Listen to this from the book of Revelation. The very last book of the Bible written by the Apostle John. This is Revelation 22 verse 3. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be in their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. It's in the light of Paul's eternal perspective, his understanding of what the church is and what the church will be, that this sorry tale of Christian pursuing Christian in a secular court before unbelievers seems so ridiculous, as Paul says, and this in front of unbelievers. Because what these Corinthian Christians are suggesting by their behavior is that despite a glorious future in Christ, 
Their priorities are still nevertheless the things of this world, accused and defendant alike. They accuse because he's willing to defraud and cheat his Christian brother to get what he wants. And the defendant, because he's willing to go to a civil court in front of everyone to get what he thinks is his in the here and now. The conduct of these Christians suggests that what matters to them is what matters to everyone else in Corinth. Reputation, property, money, the same old things. So what's the answer then? for the Corinthian Christians then and for us in 2023? Should we just think about the eternal future of God's people and try harder? Is that what Paul's suggesting? Because that sounds pretty difficult, doesn't it? If we're honest, from where we are today, reigning with God in eternity can seem a long way off, can't it? Will thinking about that be effective in motivating you and me <laughs> to right conduct with each other at Hillbank? Possibly not. But you see, Paul doesn't simply remind the Corinthian Christians of who they will be in eternity. He crucially reminds them of who they are in Christ in the present, at that very moment. And his words equally apply to us today. He does this, Paul, by highlighting the stark difference between who these Corinthian Christians once were and who they're now called to be. If you look at verse 9. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. The real significance of that list of sins that Paul provides, is that those characterize some of the Corinthian believers before they were saved. Think back to who you were before you were cleansed in Jesus. I was a drunken, lustful clown. How about you? I'm sure between all of us we could cover a whole range of sinful lifestyles and behaviors. But the point is we're called to be different now, just as Paul calls the Corinthian believers to be different. We're not the same as before, thank God. Why? Look at the second half of verse 11. <coughs> second half of verse 11. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Washed from the filth of their old lifestyles, the kind of lifestyles that still predominated in Corinth. And like those Corinthian believers, we too are people who've been cleansed from our sins, but not only washed, we've been sanctified. Jim spoke about this last week. People who are set apart by God for holy, godly living. There's to stand in complete contrast to the desperate, sinful lives that we used to live. Sanctified, but justified as well. Though formerly unjust, completely unable to get a righteous verdict from God, on our own merits. We, like the Corinthian believers, have been declared righteous in God's holy court in the person of Jesus, our only righteousness before a holy God. So our starting point as believers today is not who we will be at the end of time. It is who we are now, who we are now in Christ, washed, sanctified, and justified. Paul calls us, as he did the Corinthian Christians, to behave differently from those around us. Because God in his mercy has already removed the stain of our past sins. He's washed us. God has already begun the work of sanctification, of transformation in our lives from the people that we once were, before we were Christians, to who we will be, molded gradually into the very likeness of Jesus. A process which will only be fully realized on Jesus' final return at the end of time. And God has already given us forgiveness. He's already given us a right standing with himself in Jesus. Justification. But crucially for Paul, there has to be the closest possible relationship between the Christian's experience of God's grace, that is in being washed, in being sanctified, in being justified, and the Christian's behavior 
the experiences, the evidences, sorry, that experience of God's grace. So Paul calls the Corinthian Christians and us today to live out our experience of God's saving goodness to us and how we behave, how we behave. And of course, crucially, that includes how we behave towards our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. So how then should we as Christians deal with conflict amongst each other? How should we act when we, we feel, sorry, we've been wronged in our church family, given we're God's people, those that are set apart, that are called to be holy? Paul's been very clear in his letter to the Corinthian Christians that settling their disagreements in civil courts in front of non-Christian judges and audience was completely the wrong approach. He's also suggested it would have been better that the wronged party had accepted being cheated, had accepted being wronged. And of course, when we consider this teaching, we cannot but think of Jesus. Jesus, our saviour, the one who was so wrongfully arrested, was so unjustly charged with blasphemy and subjected to the most painful of deaths, a criminal's death on a cross. Jesus is the ultimate template for Christian living. Why? Because he's the one who laid down all his rights. He laid down all his standing, his honour, as the very son of God, that we might be called sons and daughters of God and enjoy all the rights and honour that comes with being citizens of God's kingdom. But more than that, more than that, in his life and death, Jesus encapsulated the key characteristic that defined him as both man and God and has to define us as his followers, something which he himself declared to his disciples in these simple terms. A new command I give you, John 13, verse 35, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I mean, that's crystal clear. That is our starting point as Christians today, that we love one another. This is how the wider world out there will come to know that we follow Jesus. How? On account of our love for one another. That's where it needs to start, our love for one another. And building upon that fundamental starting point, Jesus has laid down clear principles that should guide our thinking in terms of how we are to interact with each other, how we're to live this Christian life in the company of other Christians. And you'll not be surprised to know that it's the complete opposite of how society would tell you to live your life, whether Corinthian or Dundonian. In his completely countercultural Sermon on the Mount, Jesus lists the kind of traits that his followers should have and for which they, they will be blessed. And of relevance to our subject today, we should make note of these two in particular. <clears throat> blessed are the meek, for meek think humble, modest, and blessed are the peacemakers. Meek peacemakers. Does that sound like a description of people who are going to be pursuing their rights at all costs, focused on what they should get, what they're entitled to? No, it's the opposite, isn't it? It's exactly the opposite. This is suggested of, of people who aren't concerned at all about their rights, who are deliberate in their efforts to keep peace with those around them. Why? Because they're to love one another. Later in the same sermon, Jesus instructs his followers in this way, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. But even more than that, even more than that, Jesus actually provides specific instruction for believers on how we should conduct ourselves in respect of dealing with sin generally in the church. And that includes, of course, occasions when we, you and me, have been sinned against by fellow Christians. And the thrust of Jesus' teaching is entirely in accordance with the line of Paul's thinking when he asks in verse 8 of our passage, 
Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? To have legal recourse to unbelievers was to suggest that none of the church's own company were wise enough to arbitrate between one Christian brother and another. Paul points us to the need for such matters, civil matters, not criminal, not serious criminal where people are being seriously hurt, but civil matters should be dealt with within the church rather than out with, echoing the teaching of Jesus. This is recorded for us in Matthew 18, verse 15. Jesus' very words. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, if you read that in its entirety, the clear focus is upon resolving the matter peaceably, of giving every opportunity for the person in the wrong to recognize their error and be restored, to be brought back into the fold, back into good relations with those within their Christian family. The drive here is towards restoration and rehabilitation. It's not towards retribution. As we were reminded of right at the start of these studies, the Corinthian believers did not have the written gospels before them. They didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They didn't have Jesus' own words written down for them to consider. So we can be understanding of the mistakes they made when it came to conflict within the church. But we have this in black and white. Black and white. We are to seek reconciliation when we encounter conflict with each other. Following the example of our Saviour, who firstly sought peace and reconciliation for us with God. As God's people, we've been set apart to worship him, to honour and serve him, and to show Christ in the world in the way even that we behave towards each other. Remembering always the incomparable grace, the incomparable kindness and mercy that we've been shown through our Saviour. Jesus has shown his unmatched love for us. And we're called in turn to show that love to others, starting with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you don't yet know Jesus this morning, if you don't yet know what it is to be in a relationship with Jesus, to experience his unsurpassable love for you, then the opportunity stands before you now, today. I asked you at the beginning of our time together to consider how you conduct your relationships with partners, with families, with friends. The truth is that all of us by fallen nature are drawn to look after number one, to see to our own needs, to pursue our own desires, to love ourselves first and foremost. And that will always lead to conflict. That will always lead to fractured relationships, to broken hearts. The evidence is there. You don't have to look far. Hurt people <coughs> hurting each other. Hurt people hurting each other. Regardless of what the world says to you today, the answer does not lie within you. The answer does not lie within you. It lies outside of you. You need to look to Jesus, the one who loves you beyond compare, the one who loves you despite your unloveliness, despite your mistakes, despite your faults. It doesn't matter. Jesus still loves you. Put your trust in him and know what it is to be truly loved, truly loved. Only from that place, only from that place can we then love one another. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Amen. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we recognize that this is a, a real challenge for us as Christians this morning. A real challenge to read your word and to recognize that our rights, what we want, what we desire, are not to be number one. 
that ultimately we're to serve Jesus. We'd ask, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to remember the love we've been shown in Christ. That full of that love, we would be able to share that with each other. That we would be kind, that we would be meek, humble, that we would be peacemakers. That we would be those that would seek reconciliation, that we would seek out restoration with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us to show that. Help us to show us to show that to others too. That they, they might see something different in us. Because we know what it is to have been truly loved in Christ. And we'd ask Heavenly Father for any that don't know Jesus this morning. Any that don't know that love, that they would seek out the one who loves them beyond compare. <laughs> they would seek out him who's shown his love on the cross, that we would know that relationship with Christ. Heavenly Father, we'd ask that you would bless each one. And we ask it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.